This girl has something that can design innovative solutions to our biggest problems, transform the way we do business, and have a whole lot of fun doing it. Now, this girl is also my daughter, so I may be a little biased when it comes to her particular superpowers. But as much as it pains me as a proud dad to say it, what she has is not unique to her. Every other kid on earth has it. I'm talking about a child's mind. And if you're anything like me, you may have lost it somewhere along the way. But it's what we need to rediscover if we were to address some of our most grown-up of issues. Now, I'll be talking from my experience in the world of international development with some examples. But I hope that some of the principles that I talk about may also be applicable for you in your own context and challenges that you may face. Meet Paul Polak. Paul is the founder of International Development Enterprises, or IDE, an organization I also work with. Now, if you were to accuse Paul of being childish, one, you wouldn't be alone, but two, he'd take it as a compliment. You see, for the last 80 years, or maybe 180 if you listen to Paul, he has never stopped pursuing a persistent curiosity, imagining things that don't exist yet, and playing. Thirty years ago, Paul was in rural Bangladesh, meeting with village farmers who had very little land, even less money. He was pursuing a crazy idea, maybe crazy enough to be worth spreading, that businesses could serve poor rural customers, the more than a billion people living on less than a dollar a day, and make a profit doing it while enriching their lives. But he knew from his experience as a psychiatrist working with marginalized populations, that he was going to get nowhere unless he started with a deep engagement with people's experiences and perspectives. So he spent time meeting with farmers, sitting with them in their homes, walking with them on their fields to try and get inside and better understand. He likes to say when he would ask people why they were poor, they would say, well, because we don't have enough money. Okay? Not overly insightful, but maybe the starting point for a conversation. Well, why don't you have enough money? Well, you see, we're farmers. We have very small plots of land, in some cases, not really much bigger than this stage. If you really want to make money here on small plots of land, the money is in dry season vegetables grown under irrigation, but we can't do that. Well, why not? What's the problem? You see, there are people in our communities, people with connections, people with money who can afford expensive pumps. They control the resource. They charge exorbitant rent. They're like water lords. We can't afford it. Okay, maybe now we're getting somewhere. Now, if you were a farmer, a village farmer in rural Bangladesh in 1983, this wouldn't come as a particularly fresh insight for you. This would be your own lived experience. But if you were a village farmer in rural Bangladesh in 1983, you also may not be aware of some of the newer designs in manual pumps. You almost certainly hadn't heard of a new two-cylinder foot-powered treadle pump designed by Norwegian engineer Gunnar Barnes. And even if you had heard of it, you'd have no idea where to get one, certainly not from your local shops. There was an opportunity here for Paul to connect the dots between farmers' needs and aspirations, a technology that was not being fully utilized, and a market that was not serving poor rural customers. But there was still a need to play. Paul needed to work a bit with local manufacturers to play with the design to get it down to the level of extreme affordability that would really make it take off. They managed to get this pump down to $8. $30 to have it installed over a hand-drilled borehole. They went to local shops to set up the distribution and sale, and underpinned all of this with a viral marketing campaign. Now, in the early 80s in rural Bangladesh, viral marketing meant a film projector and a generator on the back of a truck, projecting a Bollywood-style film where boy meets girl, they fall in love, but there's no money for the dowry until dad gets a treadle pump. <laughs> then, as with all good Bollywood films, it ends with a wedding, Everyone sings, everyone dances, and after the movie, everyone buys a treadle pump. 
Well, okay, not everyone, but enough people did that by the early 2000s, we had seen over a million and a half sales in Bangladesh alone. We estimate worldwide that three million of these pumps have been put to use across the world. Now, we recently did a bit of a review of what was the impact of all of this, and finding for people adding another season of production, on average, they were able to make more than $300 a year in additional income. Over the first three years, $1,000. If you're living on less than a dollar a day, that's a lot of money. But equally exciting was the realization that the process that Paul used to get there could be applied to other challenges as well. What he did intuitively, the curiosity, imagination, and play, really the fundamental building blocks of what we know as human-centered design, a design process that focuses on the people, not the product. It's something that would serve us well in Southeast Asia. Our team in Vietnam took some of the advances in what we had done in agriculture and applied it to a new issue of rural sanitation. Over two and a half billion people in the world do not have access to a toilet. They took some of those same principles, deep engagement with the users, understanding the market. We're able to boost in the rural areas sales by two and a half times. Now, three years later, the World Bank went in and did a study. They found that those increases in sales had been maintained, in some cases had even increased. This was exciting. And the next challenge the World Bank wanted us to look at was to say, could you do this in Cambodia? Would this work? Now, in rural Cambodia, owners of cell phones outnumber users of toilets. We knew we couldn't just take the same solutions from Vietnam, even though it's right next door, and just plunk it into a different context. So we're back again to the curiosity stage, understanding deep engagement with the users, or prospective users. We were very lucky to have Jeff Chapin from the design firm, IDO, who was able to help walk through this process. This is what they do with their uh, commercial clients. Talking to people who pooed in toilets, people who pooed in fields, people who pooed in streams, people who pooed... Well, I think you get the idea. One of the aspects of a child's mind is you spend a lot of time talking about poo. But all that talk about poo led to a couple of key insights. One was that our traditional kind of public health approaches to motivating behavior change were not really working. They weren't touching on what were the key motivators for people to actually buy a toilet, to install one, to use it. Any of you who have worked at all in rural areas, uh, in some developing countries, may be familiar with this diagram. I've seen it on billboards, I've seen it painted on the side of schools. It's an educational tool, how open defecation can lead to various health problems through these different channels. Very nice educational tool, but not really touching on the key motivators. What were those key motivators that we heard about? Well, one of them was safety. If you have a young daughter, do you want to send her out into the field on her own at night? I don't think so. Another was pride, dignity. If your in-laws are visiting from the capital city, do you want to send them out into the field? Or do you want to offer them a nice, clean, modern facility right next to the house? We worked with a very smart marketing firm called 17 Triggers in Cambodia. They developed a brilliant marketing campaign that was based around what were the real triggers of people's behavior. As you can see, it was playful, edgy, funny, and effective. Second key insight wasn't actually so much about the product of the toilet, but the whole process of buying a toilet that needed to be redesigned. The whole experience of purchasing a toilet in rural Cambodia was broken and in need of fixing. If you were in rural Cambodia and you wanted to get yourself a toilet, you'd need to know what different components you needed, source them from two or three different suppliers, supply would often be spotty, delivery slow or even non-existent. So we worked with the manufacturers of rural pit latrines to put this all together into one package. Up top there is the slab, kind of the business end of things, uh, collection box, PVC pipe down into three concrete ring pit. That would be under the ground. But the key thing here was the packaging. You had it all together. You could order it in one go, deliver it to your house, you can install it in a day. It's the IKEA of toilets. We worked with the businesses to improve some of the efficiencies of production and to try and move from a mindset of very passive, kind of low-volume, high-margin sales to a more active, even aggressive focus on high-volume, low-margin. And using teams of local sales agents who could get out there 
get the word out and really motivate people. And as with the experience in Bangladesh, we saw sales just really taking off. So as of now, we're over 50,000 new toilets sold in rural Cambodia, and that number is climbing quickly at a rate of over 4,000 a month. Getting those pieces right, the curiosity, imagination, and play was bearing results. And what's also exciting is seeing others picking this up now. Sanitation marketing going viral, being taken up in other countries, other organizations, a lot of interest. But not in a cookie-cutter way, but rather taking the principles and applying them in different contexts. So what have we learned about a child's mind and this process? Well, as I said, first, be curious. Any of you who've been around kids know about the incessant questions. Why, why, why? Kids want to know why. They want to get down to the bottom of what's going on here. And they're not afraid to ask the obvious questions. Too often as adults, we're inhibited. We don't want to ask the obvious questions for fear of betraying our ignorance. But we're actually holding ourselves back from experiencing what a friend of mine has termed a blinding flash of the obvious. You know, what happened with pumps in rural Bangladesh or with toilets in Cambodia, a lot of that may seem obvious in retrospect, but the best ideas often do. Second is imagine things that don't exist. You know, we talk about thinking outside the box. Well, what do kids do? They take that box and they transform it into an ice cream stand or the Millennium Falcon. This is actually a picture of my wife as a kid, just a reminder that all of us have this inside us. This is part of our lived experience. But one of the things we found helpful as well is getting unqualified opinions. It really gets the juices flowing. You bring in people from outside a particular area of expertise. Paul was a psychiatrist who now is best known as an innovator in design and markets for what we call the other 90%. Much of the success in Cambodia can be attributed to the fact that we brought in business people who didn't necessarily know a huge amount about sanitation, but they knew business, they understood the markets. IDE itself, for a long time, was an outsider in the water and sanitation space until recently. But we did bring an understanding of rural markets and human-centered design. And new insights can boost that imagination, take us to a new place. And of course, play. How do kids learn? What do they do? They play. They get dirty. They fall down. They learn by doing. You know, recently, my three-year-old daughter, this is her at a, a younger age, but it was one of the best dirty pictures I could find, said to my wife, I'm making you an airplane. Well, that's great, said my wife. Are you learning about airplanes at preschool? No, she said. I'm learning about airplanes right now. We learn by doing. And one of the things that this brings us to is the F word. Yes, that F word. Failure. In play, failure is okay. It's an essential part of learning. And yet, we have an intense fear of failure, and this, in the international world, is huge. We seem to hold to the adage of never fail, never scale. But we're trying to move to more of a mindset of fail often to succeed sooner. You know, the story of toilets in rural Cambodia is on the one hand a success story, on the other hand it's actually a series of failure stories. And what we learn from that and how we move on. Some of the failures we're still working on. You know, when we first started, we thought we could turn latrine businesses into great salespeople. Well, these are people who are really skilled at making things out of concrete. They're not necessarily the guy you want up in front of a village giving a sales presentation. So it led to the insight that we really needed to be setting up these teams of local sales agents to work with these latrine businesses to boost sales. We in the entire sanitation sector have still failed to find the right answer to waste management in rural areas. Getting people to use toilets is fantastic, but what happens when that pit is full? Where does that poo go? If you're Emptying it out, dumping it into the field, much of the public health benefit is lost. So we are still playing around to find that game-changing solution for rural waste management services. So curiosity, imagination, and play. Three key elements of a child's mind that I would argue will move us forward as we look to address some of these serious issues. So let's think for a moment of what we can do to adopt a child's mind to make this world a better place, because it's far too important 
to be left to the grown-ups. Thanks very much.